Hello, and welcome back to the Argyle CX Leadership Forum. My name is Brittany Sullivan with Argyle, and it's great to have everyone joining us today. A couple notes before I turn things over to our presenter. First, to ask questions throughout the session, simply type into the Q&A chat, and we will address your questions at the end of the session. Now, without further delay, I would like to introduce our speaker, Jonathan Alloy, Digital Transformation and Growth Expert. We're excited to have Jonathan with us for a keynote titled, Embracing Artificial Intelligence to Improve the Customer Experience. Welcome, Jonathan, and over to you. Thank you. It's so nice to be here today. And I want to start by saying what an honor and a pleasure it is to join the other panelists and speakers today. If you haven't had a chance to listen to this morning's sessions, I highly encourage you to play those on the replay. They're quite excellent. We're going to be talking about artificial intelligence and customer experience, and it's important to note with this topic that there's vastly more than, the, than what could be said in a half hour session. Any one of the individual topics we're going to touch on today could be its own multi-day session, but artificial intelligence is likely the single hottest thing happening right now, and it's incumbent upon all of us as customer experience and user experience experts to understand what the dynamics of this are, what the implications are, and especially how we can leverage it in our organizations for growth and for stronger brands with our customers in a cost-effective way. There are pros and cons of AI, just like everything else, especially generative AI. And it's important to note from the beginning, and I'm going to repeat this a few times throughout our session, that the particulars of what you do are going to vary based on your industry, your brand, and your customers. There are different dynamics that play in different industries in terms of regulation, in terms of customer acceptance of experimentation, in terms of failure, in terms of data privacy. So what's right for one is not going to be right for another. It's definitely not a one-size-fits-all scenario. There is a great deal of experimentation happening in this industry right now, and there are multiple paths you can follow. So we're going to dive in. I encourage you to think about any questions you have and share them in the chat, and we'll make sure we address them at the end. The first thing I want to do today is take you through a couple of real life examples of companies that are utilizing generative AI in customer facing applications in production today. So not theory, not just experiment, but these are live where you can go out and use them and you can experience it for yourself. The first is a use case in banking with Wells Fargo Bank. I used to work at Wells Fargo for full disclosure, but I do not uh, currently work for Wells Fargo and I have no inside information. This is all based on publicly accessible information. Although that $124 number is in fact real because I did go into my account and asked it the question. So in Wells Fargo's mobile app today, Wells Fargo is one of the big four banks in the United States. They have a very large retail footprint and they have two AI powered chatbots that work across systems inside their mobile app. I took these screenshots from the Apple iOS the first is called LifeSync, and it's for wealth management. And even though I don't have a wealth management account with Wells Fargo, I do have a checking account. And so I went into LifeSync and was able to set up a goal, in this case, prepare for emergencies, a generic goal with just a generic number, $1,000. And it says, okay, you have $1,000 in your account, so you're 100% uh, progress towards achieving that goal. But what's interesting is that if I put in a different number that exceeded what I have, it could give me a plan for how to save that money over time. It would give me progress reports and it would be looking at these across all of my different accounts. So it's not just saying, oh, well, in your one checking account, you have X and that's it. It's going deeper. And it's also integrating that information with what's happening with FICO scores, what's happening with account balances, what's happening in the stock market. So it lets you get curated information that's personalized, all powered by AI. In a similar way, in their checking account in the middle uh, screen here, is an interface that they call Fargo. So the first was called LifeSync. The second is called Fargo. And this lets you ask the bank questions that you might normally have to go talk to a teller for or a banker or go in person or get on the phone. 
now you can do that yourself. You can self-service and you can ask it open-ended questions. So yes, you can say, what is my account balance? Or I need to report a stolen, lost or stolen credit card. You know, fairly straightforward things like that. But you can ask those open-ended questions like, how much do I spend on gas? And so it tells me in January, 2024, I spent $124 on gas. And then I blanked out some of the other numbers. But that's a very powerful thing in that now it's enabling self-service. It's combing through Wells Fargo's data centers to find relevant information. It's relying on a variety of structured data sources, but it's also interpreting my question from a language standpoint. So it's using that unstructured model of how much do I spend on gas is English. I'm not programming that. And then the third one I think is really compelling because this shows to me that the people at Wells Fargo who programmed this really thought about the customer experience. Because I asked it a joke. Can you tell me a joke? Is it a good joke? It's a dad joke. You know, you can say Fargo has a dad joke sense of humor. But what's important here is that it didn't just give a null result or an error. Um, uh, I don't have that information in my databases they thought about what are possible use cases. And that's one of the key things I want you to take away from this conversation today, which is that thinking about your use cases and your edge cases is so crucially important. Yes, spend 20% of your time on the happy path. Here's what I'm trying to do with the experience. Here's what happens when everything goes right. Then spend the other 80% of your time on your edge cases. What could go wrong? What could go sideways? What kinds of weird stuff would people ask my AI assistant that would have nothing whatever to do with banking or my industry or what my products are? But people might ask it. They might ask it from a humorous standpoint or because they're bored. They might ask it from a malicious standpoint. Maybe they're trying to do some phishing, cyber attacks, hacking. Uh, it, it's crucial that you think about what kind of inputs might your system get and what kind of outputs might it deliver. And we'll talk more about that later of some companies that have experienced some of those activities. But that's the first use case I wanted to take you through is about banking. The second use case I wanted to take you through is a non-regulated industry. So banking, very highly regulated, it got a lot of government controls in place. Retail, not nearly as much as in banking. So even though this looks like a Daft Punk helmet, it's actually not. Uh, this is a face mask you would use in uh, woodworking or construction uh, activities where you might face a risk of something splashing on your face. So it's uh, for protection. So I asked Amazon's AI assistant, which is now built in to the, a, uh, to the Amazon app and website. So if you go to the amazon.com website, or if you go on your phone or your tablet to the app, you can ask Amazon questions in AI, which is based on their own internal models is generating answers. So Wells Fargo system, I believe is working with Google and Amazon is working with itself. There's also tools from IBM, from Meta, uh, you know, from just about everybody you can think of large players, but this one's on Amazon. And so I asked, the system the same question in two different ways and got two different answers. And I think this is pretty powerful. If I asked it, can you wear noise protection? Can you wear ear headphones, you know, ear goggles uh, to protect your hearing from like the sound of saws? It says yes. And it's an AI generated answer. It's combing and evaluating the reviews that people have left as well as the manufacturer provided information. And some of these products have thousands and thousands of reviews and it's saying, yes, cool. But if I asked, does ear protection fit? It says no. And it says you should think about wearing small earplugs instead. So how you ask the question can return opposite results. So what's the actual answer? Well, I read some of the reviews to find out. And it turns out in this particular case, the second one was correct. You cannot wear over the ear headphones uh, to do noise reduction while you're wearing this helmet. Now, 
Full disclosure, I bought the helmet. I also bought some in-ear noise protection because I'm going to use this in my wood shop. Uh, but, but I thought it was just very interesting to share this example because this is a situation where the customer dynamics of the user experience in retail are different than they are from banking. If I ask the bank, what is my account balance versus how much money is in my account? You and I, as people know, that's the same question. The answer should be the same. You have $1 in your account, regardless of how I ask the question. There are nuances that might make the answer not $1. And it's incumbent upon us as the programmers, the trainers of these AI models to elucidate or to explain what that $1 balance might mean. But there's a big difference between saying to a bank, how much money do I have in my account? And uh, what is my balance and getting different answers than in retail? Now in retail, the downside of getting these different answers could be if I only asked one, and got an answer that was unsatisfactory for me, I might not buy the product. So that's a lost sale. And it's incorrect information, which can be challenging as well, because as other things like search engines comb the uh, databases of merchants, they're extracting that information for use in their own listings. So all of a sudden, your incorrect information about your product can literally go viral. It can spread and become accepted as truth. And so now you've potentially lost a lot of sales. So there is a risk of lost sales in a retail environment, but you're not going to lose your house to foreclosure because your balance was wrong. And that's a big difference in the different industries and what's being faced there. So it's incumbent upon us to understand our customers, but it's also really crucially important to think about what are the downsides of how I train my models and what information am I pushing out there into the world for my company about my products? Because there is a chance that that can get picked up and reinforce an incorrect message, and then it becomes very difficult and expensive to correct that. So we're gonna stay with Amazon for a second and go to a similar use case, but I thought this was kind of quirky and fun, which is the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, which has one of the most famous AIs in all of history, which is the HAL 9000 computer. So somebody on Amazon, uh, Mobius Models, created a model of the HAL 9000 interface. And one of the things Amazon does that I think is really powerful as an AI tool is down in the bottom left here, what the customers say is they're auto-generating a summary of those customer reviews, even without me asking the question. So remember in the first use case here about the helmet, I was asking information about the helmet and it was returning it. Here, Amazon is proactively pushing an AI-generated summary of the product to me. And it even tells me what it scores highly on. Ease of assembly high, value, mixed reviews. But you can still ask the AI questions. So famous thing in the movie, if you've seen 2001, is that Hal goes crazy and kills the crew. It won't open the uh, doors to the spacecraft for a spaceman who's left outside. So I ask it, is it going to open the pod bay doors? And the AI says, no, this model cannot open the pod bay doors. So there's no humor here. There's no kind of cheekiness of, oh, I know what you're doing. You're asking it. Like, for example, if you ask Alexa, which is an Amazon device, uh, Alexa, open the pod bay doors, it will respond with a wink and a nod saying, I'm sorry, Dave, I can't do that, which is the line from the movie. And it goes on because there's a wink and a nod uh, put in about a little bit of self-effacement of the personality of Alexa. Here, you don't see that. It's just third person, very factual, static display model, does not have any moving parts or functions. So I ask it, will it kill my crew? Which is what the psychotic AI machine does in the movie. Again, totally made up. Uh, now it's speaking in the first person. It's saying, I don't have enough information. I, so now it's personalizing the bot. It's not third person anymore. Uh, but it is putting in a safety caution. 
I would not recommend using it in any way that could endanger people. If you have concerns about safety, consult with an expert. Those things don't happen by accident. They happen because of how you train your models and how you program them to respond to certain keywords or prompts. Uh, keep in mind, artificial intelligence isn't. There's nothing smart or intelligent about these systems. They're applied statistical models. What word is most likely to come after this? So there's no judgment the way that human beings have judgment. Uh, there's no common sense. These are, it's, it's still computers, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So it's incumbent upon us to train them to react in ways that we have to give that common sense because the computer doesn't have it. So we've looked at a couple of use cases here, one in a regulated industry of banking with Wells Fargo and one in a retail unregulated industry with Amazon. And we looked at a couple different examples of how those play out. I wanted to share some information about satisfaction of how are people, consumers responding to these different AI implementations. So SurveyMonkey did a, did a uh, survey and they asked a variety of different questions. It's a fascinating study. The link is down there about how people react to AI. And you can uh, actually sort their cross tabs and get really insightful information by gender, by generation, a lot of different ways. I just did some summary scores here. The top one, likelihood to recommend following your last interaction with a customer service agent. Net promoter score. So how likely are you to recommend this product or service? NPS, very standard across many industries. So when the last interaction was with a human customer service agent, we had a positive six NPS. When it was with an AI, it became a negative 66. And then on the bottom half here, what is the comfort level that people have of you as using an AI chatbot, assuming it's available and easy to use? For different tasks, people are still somewhat uncomfortable with a variety of things. And you notice that the more impactful it is to them, the less comfortable they are using it. So getting medical advice, very high barrier to entry there for utilizing AI versus ordering food or drinks, very low consequences if something gets messed up. So again, very important to understand your brand, your audience interaction, and the trust relationship you have and what the downsides are if something goes wrong. So I don't want to scare you, but I do want to give you some cautions because this is an experimentation industry right now. AI is not fully mature. We don't even necessarily know what mature means. Are we looking to enable computers to pass the Turing test? Are we looking for computers to truly self-drive cars in ways that are safer than human beings, which has not been achieved? Uh, you know, the, the, the barriers, the standards are still in flux. So I want to just make sure that you're aware of some examples where things have been a little wonky. So the one in the middle here, there was a Chevy dealership in California that implemented a no-code chatbot. So this is one of these very simple plugins that a group was selling and the dealership said, hey, I can get 24 seven service. People can ask it questions about pricing. This is a win win. So they put the chatbot in and somebody tricked it into saying, yes, I will sell you an $80,000 car for one dollar. Now, they didn't actually have to sell the car for a dollar. Or maybe it was debatable whether they could have. The point being that you have to be prepared for those kinds of things. Uh, there were lawyers, there were multiple cases in the end of last year where lawyers submitted fake cases that were AI hallucinations in their legal briefs. Now, you can definitely fault the lawyers for not checking that Smith versus Smith was a real case before filing it with the court when they asked ChatGPT for tell me some cases relevant to this topic. That's fine. That's on the lawyer. The point being, though, to my earlier comment, what happens as the use of AI increases to the point that it doesn't just create a text prompt answer, but it creates an entire web microsite instantly that gets crawled by a search engine. And all of a sudden, what you invented, or rather what the AI invented based on your prompt, now has the appearance of legitimacy. It looks real. Uh, when it comes to doing things like making decisions, 
there's a big case in health insurance right now about is AI making decisions and are those decisions correct in regards to billing or service that can have life and death implications. Uh, just the sheer volume of training material that goes in to training one of these chatbots, training one of these AI models, there's a big debate right now in the industry about what is the source of that data and are the models using copyrighted information and what are the implications of that? So again, something you have to think about. So I'm going to go now to the slide that if you were going to take a screenshot of one slide, it would be this one. And this is where I think you really could, you know, schedule an entire day's conversation about any one of these 20 points. Uh, but what I wanted to do is leave you with 10 specific kinds of experiences that are viable with today's technology for you to consider for your company, for your brand, of how to engage with your customers in positive experiences. And that ranges from engaging in conversation and discussion, finding patterns, helping your employees or your customers make decisions, improving your processes and optimizing and automating them, providing personalized content, running A-B testing, running variations, uh, recommending solutions that may be appropriate for a given situation, whether that's what size you might want to try on, what things go with each other, uh, or supporting employees. You know, if you can train an employee to use an internal AI tool to comb your internal databases, instead of training that employee to independently search a dozen different data sources, then they can be faster in synthesizing that information and can provide presumably better answers to your customers. The flip side of that though, the flip side of all of these are these crucial considerations. And just to speak about that, that first one, what is your data hygiene? I'm just gonna pick any one of these at random. What is your data hygiene? Do you have 10-year-old PowerPoints that to the eyes of a computer are just as valid as the one you did last month? So how does the computer know which information is correct versus what's out of date? If you have emails that are ancient, is it going to pick things up that are confidential? Because it's scouring all your databases. When you train your models, what is the implicit bias you might be building into those because there's bias in how we make decisions? What are the triggers that you're building in for when you want to drop out of an AI chat and go to a human agent? What is the level of accuracy that you're providing and what are the implications if you provide something wrong? And ultimately, what is the governance that you have around the use of AI? I will say, it's not necessarily going to be cheaper. You're just going to be spending money on different things. Now, you might get a great return on it, and I hope you do, and that's why I'm an advocate for it. But I want you to go in with eyes open. So this is me. You're welcome to connect. would love to talk with you more. We're going to take some questions now. So before I start taking questions and turn it back over to Brittany and Lindsay, we're going to give AI the last word. So I asked Google Bard, which is one of the big publicly available AI uh, generative engines, to tell me what it thinks is the greatest strength and the greatest challenge of using AI. And here's what it said. Generative AI empowers you to understand each customer like a best friend, but the greatest danger lies in forgetting true friendship comes from the heart, not algorithms. Pretty powerful emotional statement from a computer. So I took Google Bard's answer and I gave it to Shutterstock, Dolly, which is a generative image program, and it created that image for us. So with that, happy to take any questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for such an insightful presentation. Um, as a reminder to the audience, you can still enter questions and we'll go ahead and review a few that came through. Uh, Jonathan, this first question asks, do you have any tips for ensuring seamless integration of new AI technologies into existing frameworks to enhance customer experience? So the most important tip, again, is to have a very clear sense of what it is you're trying to achieve and to have a strong governance model in place. The technology piece is not simple, but relative to those other things, it might actually be the easiest piece 
because it's about having a very clear agile backlog to give to your developers of here are our priorities, here's the backlog of what we have to do first, uh, and here's what the outputs are expected to be in terms of the experience. And if you have a smart development team, they'll be able to iterate with you uh, over agile sprints to integrate the technology and provide the experience that you want. But you have to, again, think about what are the biases? What are the potentials for misuse? How are we ensuring privacy? And privacy goes multiple ways. We didn't talk a lot about privacy, but think about privacy in the sense of if customer information is coming into my chatbot and that's refining my model, or if it's not even a chatbot, if it's an internal AI tool, but we have confidential information coming in, what are the potential ways that that might leak? Are we utilizing information from client A to develop a response for client B? Does that violate a non-disclosure agreement with client A? Are we utilizing a licensed AI tool from a platform, whether it's Google or Meta or Amazon, IBM, whoever, is what we develop actually feeding back into those public models? And what are the implications of that? Or are we running it in-house? And if we're running it in-house, what's the tech stack that we're really going to need to do that effectively? So having those governance provisions in place is probably the most important thing you can do. Excellent. Thank you so much. And this next question, I think it's a good follow-up question. Um, how can you navigate ethical considerations associated with AI, especially when it comes to privacy and data security? Oh boy. Again, that could be a weeks long topic in itself. The EU just came out with new AI rules. The White House is coming out with AI rules in the United States. There are a lot of industries that are formulating their own rules in academia with universities, for example, about the role of AI, even in K through 12 schools about how students use it. Uh, when you go into Shutterstock, you know, they have a whole page about how to attribute these images correctly. Uh, that are AI generated images built on the creative work of people. There are a lot of authors that are suing uh, because of the, you know, there's uh, New York Times bestselling authors and the New York Times itself are both suing OpenAI and Microsoft, alleging that they use copyrighted works to train their models, which is an ethical consideration. I think a lot of it comes down to disclosure, which is one of the items I have on the page here is a crucial consideration. So you need to be upfront and honest with yourselves and with your stakeholders about what you're doing and how that might differ. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we have time for a couple more questions. This next question, where is a good place to start with AI when you're from a smaller company? So a great place to start is probably doing some investigation on your own and starting to get a feel for what some of those chatbots and some of those image generation and other tools look like. And after you get a feel for using it yourself, just asking silly questions or things, uh, find out if there's an industry association that you're part of. So the National Association of X Industry and find out what they're looking at and talk to them and see if they have any recommendations, if they have use cases, if they have ethics guidelines. Uh, if there are models that are being explored, and then talk to your customers in an appropriate way to do some research and find out what their expectations are. What's really important is understanding your industry, your brand, and your customers for your unique selling proposition and the value that you provide. What it is for A is not going to be the same as it is for B. So you have to have your own sense of here's the value we're going to create that's additive. We're not just doing it because it's cool. We want to do it because we're helping our customers make better decisions, make faster decisions, streamline our processes. Whatever your goal is, start talking to your ecosystem of suppliers and tech partners about what they're seeing in your space that help achieve those results. Great. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And it looks like we have time for one question. I think this is a good question to close out with. Um, can you make any suggestions for keeping up with emerging trends in AI? You know, it's funny. Uh, there was just a big world economic forum in Davos where all of the muckety mucks of the planet get together. And if you go to their website and search on AI, there's something like a thousand documents that come up about AI. It's completely overwhelming. 
Uh, there's just so much happening in the space. So there unfortunately isn't a super easy way. One option could be leveraging AI to help sort through that information for you. Find one of the engines that you like, whether it's GPT-4 or Google Bard or you know whatever seems to give you the best results and start prompting it to provide summaries for you. Uh, and, and that can be beneficial. And then in the same way as the last question, Talk to your industry associations and your key tech partners and find out if they're putting out credible vetted information on a recurring basis, maybe weekly, biweekly, monthly, about what's the latest and greatest and how it impacts your industry. Excellent. Well, thank you so much again, Jonathan, for such an incredible keynote presentation. I also wanted to thank everyone who joined us today. This session, along with all of today's content, will be made available on demand following the event. Thank you again, Jonathan.